Good afternoon. Welcome you here to Maple Park Church. I'm Pastor Adam. And this morning we're going to be opening with hymn number 530. Please take your hymnals out and stand as we sing 530, Be Still My Soul. On behalf of Celia's family, I welcome you here to Maple Park Church. We're gathered to remember the life of Celia and to, fight, and to find comfort in grief. Matt chose the hymns and scripture readings because they give hope in this life. They give us strength that transcends our journey that can be painful. In these readings and songs of faith, people have found light in dark valleys. Not everyone shares the same faith or beliefs, but I truly believe that anyone with an open mind and heart can find peace in the ancient words of scripture and in the songs of faith. So we invite all people to join us today. And we open this service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first lesson comes from St. John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace and place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Here is the reading of our gospel lesson. Praise to you, O Christ. Everyone needs grace. And as Pastor Sandy is going to sing... Grace is so sweet. Grace is a breath of fresh air when you get something by complete surprise. Celia was a gift of grace. Like you and I, she wasn't perfect. Like you and I, she was human. Yet her gifts to you, her gifts to our community, to our world, are a reflection of God's grace. The gift of teaching music was a gift she gave. Wherever she lived, she left a music legacy, a legacy of music education. She couldn't keep her love of music to herself. She had to give it away. Her gift of grace was teaching music. And our world is a better place. You're a better person because God gave the gift of Celia. And God, he could not keep his greatest gift to himself. He gave us Jesus, who was a bright and shining light in human history and in our lives today. Grace is sweet. Grace is the gift of the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. Grace is the gift of eternal life given to all who believe. Let's be reminded of that grace. My sister, Pastor Sandy, is going to come and sing. Oh, let life be 
Thank you, Pastor Sandy. Everyone needs grace in life, and everyone needs a shepherd through life. A shepherd leads, a shepherd protects. Celia reflected God's shepherding nature. She tirelessly worked to lead and protect her two children through this life. She was also a leader and protector of sorts for many students. And I'm sure that her leadership in our community was more than her love of music, but she's a person who set an example and cared for her family, her friends, and her students. I want you to know that God is our good shepherd who promises to lead and to protect us through this life and into life everlasting. So I invite you today to open your bulletins and to recite with us the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Another gospel lesson for the service today comes from St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Christ. Children set an example for us. We can learn a lot from kids. And Celia's passion was to teach children. But I imagine the kids in Celia's life taught her much more than she could ever teach them. And Jesus said, look at the children. They have so much, they have so much to teach us. They set the example of faith in God and a life of love. Children, they they trust. They're not yet cynical and hard-hearted. Are you cynical? Are you weary, wearied by this world? I encourage you to to look to the children, to follow their example, and then trust in Christ. Trust in the trustworthy one who took children in his arms. Trust that he receives his children into his arms in heaven. Please open your hymnals to number 84, stand together, and we'll sing the hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father. Stay. 
God his children ne'er forsaketh is the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. We may standing for our last reading from the Gospel of John, the third chapter. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Here ends the reading of our gospel lesson. Praise to you, O Christ. Would you pray with me? Thank you for loving us so much, Heavenly Father, that you sent your only begotten Son to rescue us from sin and death. And Jesus, may we be brought from death to life everlasting by your sacrifice for us upon the cross. When we look to the cross, may we see life. When we look to the cross, may we see love. When we look to the cross, may we see hope. Thank you, Jesus, for your life given for our life. And today we walk in the hope and in the strength of everlasting life given to us by grace, through faith. Amen. You may be seated. Matt. So when love is deep, much can be accomplished. So if you're a Suzuki kid, or if you've read uh, Dr. Suzuki's book, that's, that's one of his most famous quotes. <clears throat> and uh, let's, is the slides going again? Let's get those happening. So at a time like this, um, everybody's in a certain amount of shock, of course, and we're all kind of looking upon our life for looking upon my mom's life, but then when you get to my age, when you're in your 50s, you're like, well, it won't be too long when this, my life's going to be over. And so you start thinking about things. Um, I know the James Webb telescope just gave us a deep, um, whatever you call it, deep whatever, I can't come up with the word right now, but basically they looked at a tiny square of the sky that looked like it was empty and turned on the telescope and let it sit there for a few days and lo and behold the picture that came out was thousands of galaxies that seemed to go on forever and then so you look at that and you think wow we're living in an awfully big universe then you look at our own galaxy which is the Milky Way, which itself has billions of stars in it. And then you think, even that's awfully big. And then you come in a little bit and you see this lonely little sun with a tiny blue dot sort of skirting out at the, ex at the excerpts of it. And you're like, what's that? You go in a little closer and now you see like this little blue bubble that seems to be this tiny little marble floating in a sea of infinity. And if you zoom in a little closer, then you see, we just saw it go by. This hand on the face of the earth, something in the shape of a hand, well, that 
hand is the state of Michigan. If you zoom in a little closer, you see, it's hard to see on that map, but there's a little star that says Saginaw, and that's the town that my mom grew up in when she was a kid, and there's my mom when she was a little baby growing up in Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, she started taking, well, she also dressed up as a bunny. <laughs> um, after being a bunny, she decided that she really liked playing the piano and she took piano lessons from the neighborhood piano teacher. And um, that went on for several years and she started getting older and growing up and getting pigtails and wearing little hats and more pigtails. Um, and then at some point, kind of out of her own uh, volition, she decided she wanted to play the violin. And her parents were good enough to find her a violin teacher, and she started playing violin. And um, that continued through high school until she decided to go to the University of Michigan and study music. And there, um, she decided she wanted to become a music teacher. And somehow, at that point, she found out about this new thing happening in the United States called the Suzuki Method, Suzuki Violin Method. And so she took that to heart, and she got hooked up with um, this movement, which was just getting started, because we're talking like 1970. And she managed to um, get herself invited to go to Japan, to Matsumoto, Japan, and take lessons from Dr. Suzuki himself in Matsumoto. And now we're kind of, the slides are flying by, but at some point you're gonna see a picture of the Matsumoto Cho. Um, and the crazy thing was um, she was welcomed with open arms by all, by all the people involved with Suzuki, all the Japanese people. And you have to realize at that time, um, for example, now, 25 years ago, in 1998, I can remember all kinds of stuff that was going on in my life. And I can vividly remember where I was working, who my friends were. I, it was on, I had just met my, who is now my wife, Bev. We'd known each other for about a year, and um, we worked in the same office. There's all kinds of things that I vividly remember from 25 years ago. Well, in Japan, there were all these people who could remember vividly what happened in 1945, which was the United States of America dropped a nuclear bomb and destroyed two of their cities. Now, <laughs> if, for example, North Korea had sent a missile over across the, this, the sea and blowing up Seattle in 1998, and now some North Koreans came visiting, I don't think I would be very happy to see them even now, right? But yet, somehow, the Japanese culture, which at the time, I, you, there was no way you could say that that was a Christian nation, right? I don't even think even now, you, I, the, the main religion in Japan is Shintoism and Zen Buddhism and so on. Yet, they seem to embody, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So, <laughs> there you have it. So they welcomed her, her with open arms and taught her the Suzuki method. And she got to take lessons with Dr. Suzuki and um, be with the whole community and then moved back to uh, Michigan. And um, oh, I should say along the way I was born. <laughs> Before then I was born in Hawaii. That's why we have all these Hawaii pictures. Um, but by the time she came back, um, my sister was born and we started doing group lessons. This is a group lesson, uh, just flew by. But what we just saw was a group lesson in Michigan um, with several Japanese students and Japanese teachers that had come from Japan as part of 
of the movement of the Suzuki method. And so that's what's happening up on the screen right there. Um, so it began in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Then uh, we lived there for quite a while until in 1974, my sister and I and my mom again went back to Japan and um, got to be with Dr. Suzuki again. And we got to take lessons, both this, my sister and I got to take lessons with Dr. Suzuki right there in his studio every day for like a month, which was, we were kids, so the thing that we remembered the most and were most fascinated with was the fact that he smoked these cigarettes <laughs> with the little plastic filters and that ashes would get about that long and we'd be waiting for the ashes to fall on the floor <laughs> until suddenly he'd flick it in the ashtray right at the last second. So that's a kid for you, like that's what you remember the most out of that whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, um, the, the reason why we, I brought, we wanted to use these readings today is that the whole spirit of the Suzuki method is um, Dr. Suzuki, of course, was deeply moved by World War II, and of course what happened, you know, to the two cities that were completely destroyed. And, but he decided, you know, maybe there's something better we can do on the Earth, this tiny little blue dot floating in a sea of infinity, besides building factories to build weapons so we can blow ourselves up, you know? So he got fascinated with working in this factory that instead of making bombs, made violins. And he said, okay, maybe, maybe that would be better, you know? Let's do that. Let's make violins and let's teach music, you know, and let's play music that everyone can understand. Like, people might not speak Japanese, they might not speak Spanish or French or Italian or even English, but all these people can listen to the exact same piece of music and appreciate it and be moved by it. And so that, that thing, okay, let's use music to bring the whole world together. And then, so that was the Suzuki method. And then of course the other radical thing that he, he came up with was, well, let's teach it to little children Instead of waiting until they're like 10 or 11 or 12 years old to start music, let's teach it to them when they're three and four. Because he had this idea that, well, little kids can learn their language without picking up a book, without going to school. They just learn it through imitation. So let's try that with music. And what do you know? It works. So, and that was like the miracle of the Suzuki method. The first time these Japanese came to the US, there would be these three and four year olds up on the stage playing Vivaldi Concerto in A minor, and all the, all the music teachers are going, how can that be? <laughs> so, and no one would, would have believed it if they hadn't have seen it and heard it with their own eyes and ears. So, people asked Dr. Suzuki, what's the secret? And he said, well, just start the kids young and let them imitate and work closely with their mother and, and their parents. Generally speaking, in Japan, it would always be the mother. And um, he also had this radical idea that, um, that if a mother has a child that's to be born and, and is, is growing in her womb, and she wants that child to be a classical musician, well, she should already listen to classical music. Um, and maybe even listen to it rather loudly so that the baby in, inside the mother can hear the music. So that even before the baby is born, it's already hearing the music. And when the baby does get born, it already comes out into the world and it says, okay, where's my violin? I'm ready to start. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be flute or cello or piano or anything. Now, it started out with violin, but now it can be any instrument. So that was just that complete natural idea of what the Suzuki method would be. And that was, that entire thing was basically my mom's life mission. And so that's what she embraced and um, that's what we did. Um, we came back from uh, our, her second time in Japan, back to Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, my dad got transferred 
to, he was an engineer, and he got a new job to go work on the space shuttle, on the avionics system of the space shuttle, which happened to be in Florida. So we all got up and moved to Florida, Clearwater, Florida, and started up a Suzuki program down there. Um, that lasted about a year, and then my dad got transferred again, and we then moved out to Seattle. And have been, let's call it Greater Seattle ever since. Uh, technically, we lived on Bainbridge Island for quite a while. And once again, uh, my mom got a Suzuki program going on there, and literally, we had group lessons in our living room, in our house, and it wasn't that big of a house. And then we had cars parked once a week. It was, I think it was Wednesday evenings. It was like we were having a block party once a week. <laughs> All the neighbors were wondering what's going on. But then, you know, before you knew it, she had like 20 Suzuki kids right there on Bainbridge Island. And then another 20 students in Seattle. She would take the ferry over to Seattle and teach over there um, at this little house right next to St. Mark's Cathedral. I don't know if everybody knows where that is, but St. Mark's Cathedral is in the Capitol, in the Capitol Hill. It's this gigantic church that um, it looks like it was designed for giants that are like 20 feet tall. It's huge. Everything's like scaled up. And um, one thing that happens there that's been going on for decades is this thing called the Confluence Service, where every Sunday night people go and sing Gregorian chants. And it get, draws a huge crowd and people come, you know, all the, all, the, all the hip people from Broadway love to come and hear this Gregorian chanting. You know, it's so good and it's such an amazing space that they just go and experience it. So right next to that place was the Suzuki School in Seattle, literally on the other side of the parking lot. And um, I, again, as a kid, what I remember the most is after our lessons, we would go outside and play hide and seek in the, in the bushes, you know, with our friends, which are, of course, the other Suzuki kids, too. So, so, that, that, so that was the 80s. Um, then uh, later on, I don't really have, I have hardly any pictures of, of my real dad. Walt is my stepdad. My real dad, we don't have many pictures because um, he was mostly taking pictures of my mom. <laughs> and the kids, so. Um, but uh, when I was in eighth grade, my parents got divorced and um, we moved to Seattle and uh, made it through high school. Um, and then in the late 80s, I think it was 1986 is when my mom met Wall, because my stepdad who also passed away in the past year or so. And, um, he was her life partner for the second half of her life. And uh, the great thing about Walt is um, Walt was very dependable, kind of your, he, he, he was in the Air Force, he worked at Boeing, um, always held a steady job, and he, he, he was on the church council at the Methodist Church, he sang in the choir, and he loved to do um, volunteer work and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he even had a paper route when he was like 75 years old. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so he really took care of my mom a lot and that was a, quite a bit different than my real dad. My real dad was, let's say, a character. So um, also he struggled with bipolar and alcoholism and stuff. So we had all kinds of chaotic stuff going in our going on in our family when we were kids. So when Walt showed up, it was kind of like a completely new chapter in our life. And uh, so we really appreciate what he did for giving us an idea of what a stable family is like, after all. So um, then things went on. Um, my mom kept teaching for a long, long time, and we have a whole bunch of my mom's students are here in the audience. Now we're all grown up. Um, several of them now are Suzuki teachers as well. And so um, we just keep, the tradition just keeps going on and on like that. Um, I wanted to read another quote. I had a bunch of quotes to read, but uh, 
we're going to skip most of them, but this is one that I, I wanted to bring up, which is uh, by Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Bach was a Lutheran after all. And so it's appropriate since we're here at a Lutheran church. Um, there's a famous cantata, which is called Bacchet Auf, which means wake up. And the first lines of that cantata is, wake up, the voice calls us of the watchmen high up on the battlements, wake up. So on a day like this, that's a, that's a perfect thing to contemplate because there's so many people, so many saints and so many deep thinkers will say to us, you know, we go through life, it's almost like we're half asleep our entire life, you know? So we need to wake up and really, truly experience our life before suddenly it's gone, right? Either our life is gone or, some, or one of our loved ones is suddenly not there anymore. So we have Bach sing Bach it auf. Dum pa da 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 dum pa dum pa dum pa da dum pa dum pa dum beautiful melody. Then we have Rumi, who is a Sufi poet. He's part of the Sufi tradition, which is the great, the mystical tradition of, of Islam. And he says things, for example, remember when we were talking about that tiny little blue dot in the sea of infinity, the tiny little drop? Well, Saints like to talk about this universe that we live in as like this ocean, or sometimes they call it the ocean of consciousness. Well, one of Rumi's famous quotes is, you're not just a drop in the ocean, you are the ocean in a drop. So, another one that he, that he says is this, he says, Wake up, lovers. It's time to start the journey. We've seen enough of this world. Now it's time to see another. These two gardens may be beautiful, but let us pass beyond them and go to the gardener. Let us kiss the ground and flow like a river towards the ocean. Let us go from the valley of tears to the wedding feast, and let us bring the colors of blossoms to our pale faces. Powerful stuff. So, again, Dr. Suzuki was talking about with, with great love, anything can be accomplished. Um, we have other people that say that as well. Um, we have, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who says, love is the greatest force in the universe. It is the heartbeat of the natural cosmos. He who loves is a participant in the being of God. You know, that wasn't Rumi saying that. That was Martin Luther King said that. So with that, um, let's bring Pastor Adam back up and we'll say some prayers and then we're going to have an open mic. And let us go before the Lord in prayer. Let's speak to the God who loves us, speak to the God who invites us into a relationship with himself. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Uh, we do thank you and we praise you uh, that you are a God who comes near to us in every season of life and every difficulty of, of life. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant that all of us in Christ, who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, 
that we may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and that through the grave and the gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. And grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. And grant your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. And grant that all who mourn, give them a sure confidence in your loving care, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. And give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. And we pray that you would help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. And grant us grace to entrust Celia Nix to your never-failing love, which sustained her in this life. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, and remember her according to the favor you bear for your people. And God of all grace, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We are going to have an opportunity now where you can share memories of Celia's life. I'm going to actually have to go back and grab a microphone. But don't be shy to share your memories, to share things that are meaningful to you about Celia. Just raise your hand. So what we can do is, um, if you're able-bodied and you want to risk coming up these stairs, you can, you can come right up to the lectern here and give your story. Otherwise, we also have Pastor Adam with the roaming mic and just raise your hand and he can bring it right to you. Uh, Celia loved to tell this story. She was working in the kitchen uh, Matthew was a, a toddler, and he was in the other room, and uh, she noticed that things were pretty quiet in there, so she better check on him. So she went in, and he had climbed up on the piano bench because her violin was sitting on the top of the upright piano. And he had gotten her violin out of its case, and he was playing it as a toddler. He had never had it before in his hands, but he took it upon himself to take that violin out of her violin case and play it. She loved to tell that story. I just want to say uh, thank you to my grandma um, for her kindness and wisdom. Uh, these past few years, we talked a lot. Uh, whenever we talked about teaching, it, it always brought her back, um, and there was always new knowledge to be gained. Um, now, I'm a teacher myself, and I find myself carrying all her wisdom with me every time I teach. Um, and, like, how to how to put the person first, um, and put humanity first, um, and that music is an, is an art for expressing ourself. Um, and you know that we, we, we challenge ourselves to always improve ourselves, but in the end we are here to, 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 uh, 
to share with others um, and be a community. Um, and that's always been a great asset to me uh, when I teach um, and to, and yeah, I don't know, public speaking. <laughs> I was fortunate to have met Matthew and Celia in 1983 at Celia's home out in Laurelhurst. And we were rehearsing the Wieniawski second movement, the romance of his second violin concerto. And uh, I was sight reading Matthew at the age of 17, already had the piece well under his fingers. <laughs> From time to time, a voice would float out from the kitchen, very gently but firmly admonishing me as to how to play the phrasing of the piece in the piano reduction. Little did I know that uh, 40 years ago, that initial meeting would spawn a friendship lasting for 40 years. It became apparent early on that for Celia, music was the axis mundi. It was the pole around which her entire world revolved, as essential and vital as was sleeping, loving, breathing, and eating. I was fortunate to be able to participate in her second marriage in 1987. She would have been about, I believe, about 49 years old at the time and um, was taking part in the rehearsal with Matt and his sister Martha and they did the first movement of the Bach Violin Concerto for two violins. Um, Pam, was, where's Pam? Pam was, was the one who was accompanying us. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was the rehearsal, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, the juncture in my life with Celia happened primarily um, at times when she would travel to foreign countries. And I had the opportunity to house set for her and Walt when they were gone. And um, got a wonderful earful of what took place when she came back. And I just wanted to quickly run some of the places that she had visited in her first trip. She went to see the glories of art in Italy. First, on a boat going towards the city of Venice, she described to me how the fog and the mids had suddenly parted and she saw this magical, wonderful city appearing with its canals. She had an opportunity to visit St. Mark's Cathedral and uh, attend some concerts in the evening time outside of the cathedral of orchestras that were playing Vivaldi. She also visited the Doge's Palace. From there, she went to Milan and saw the cathedral with its thousand spires. And of course, no visit to Milano was complete without going to the refectory of the Church of Santa Maria del Grazi, where Leonardo had painted the Last Supper. From there on, she went to Florence and, of course, visited the obligatory museums of the Pitti and the Uffizi. But the real glory of that city was the giant sculpture of David that was carved by Michelangelo in the Academia. And then after that, of course, on to Rome, where she saw the larger-than-life cathedral of St. Peter's. 
But the real excitement for her was the Basilica Church of Santa Cecilia and Trastavari, which was the final resting place of her namesake, Cecilia. How appropriate that she was named after the patron saint of music and musicians. So, oddly enough, if you break down the name, it translates into she who is blind to her own beauty. The second trip took place in Southeast Asia. She went to Thailand and this particular journey was a real transformative and profound trip for her. She came back in a state of excitement and she kept saying over and over again, I just met the happiest people in the world. I can't believe it. Everyone was so happy. And she began to describe to me how even though most of the people were under the poverty line and they had worked perhaps 16 hour days, they still found time to make donations to the temples there in Bangkok. She just couldn't get over it. And you could tell it really had quite an effect on her. Um, there was another trip that was supposed to have lasted several weeks to the San Juans. And I remember seeing her off watching the seaplane rise from Lake Union up into the sky and then go on until it was nothing but a dot. And several days later, <laughs> received a phone call. And what had happened was she had had an acute attack of appendicitis. And because there were no hospitals there, they had, she had to be emergency airlifted by helicopter to Seattle. Fortunately, she survived. The other juncture point for me that created a lot of appreciation, um, I was having difficulty during the holidays with my family of origin and she was always welcoming me to her house for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. Um, after the meal had ended and we rolled away from the table in the comatose state, the evening hadn't finished yet. We ended up going into the living room to make music. Uh, scores of Corelli and Handel were plopped on the piano and uh, I had to sight read and I hadn't, I was really out of practice. So numerous notes were either omitted or misplayed. But Celia was very accommodating. She, she wasn't bothered by that. The important thing for her was that I was there and I was doing it. She had a great openness to foreign cultures and particularly to Chinese medicine, which she practiced most of her life. The thing I will miss is not seeing her and Walt coming through the doors of this church to the Octava concert with a smile on her face and with her aesthetic sensitivity and her knowledge of culture to be able to talk with her during the intermission and after the concert, you know, to talk about the different pieces that were played. The last time I saw her was last Thanksgiving and plans were afoot for her to play in a Mendelssohn trio this spring. Can you imagine doing that at the age of 84? Um, unfortunately, that never came to pass. Um, I should probably make it a little quick here, but I don't want to leave out the fact that later in life, um, she began to explore her artistic talents, some of the wonderful drawings and paintings that you saw on the screen. She was particularly adept at portraiture, at investing 
human faces with life and personality. I will really miss her compassion, her love and caring, and her motherly sense of nurturing. Thanks. Okay. So now what we're going to do is the type of thing that my mom's done her whole life, which is a Suzuki group concert. So we're going to have all the Suzuki kids, most of whom are grown up now, come on stage. And we're going to do a concert Suzuki group lesson style. So the way you do that is you start out with the most advanced piece and then you sort of work your way down until you finally end up with the foundational piece of the whole Suzuki method which is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, one thing that's different that you don't see in most Suzuki concerts is that we have a marimba player. <laughs> That would be Mr. Ian Alvarez, who today was playing piano. He's also going to be playing marimba. But he also teaches strings, like violin, viola, and cello in the Edmond School District. So we're going to allow him in there. <laughs> <laughs> and Liz Q is going to lead us. So everybody, just call, come up onto the stage. Typically speaking, we're not supposed to use music stands and music, but a lot of us are out of practice, so we got to sort of cheat. If this were a, a, a typical Suzuki concert, everybody would be playing by memory. And if you couldn't remember the piece, you'd be listening to the person next to you trying to copy them. Do we have enough chairs? Oh, no blue tape, okay.
Thank you. I didn't know we were going to have a concert tonight, too. You are invited to dinner in the parish hall after I get the benediction. I want to thank you on behalf of the family for coming today. Receive now the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you may go in peace.